Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for you. We thank you for this day that you've given us, for this church family that we have. Thank you for this time of worship. And, and we ask now, Lord, as we open up your word, uh, that you would speak to us anew. Lord, that we would experience your presence in a new way, that you would challenge us and encourage us and remind us of the love that you have for each one of us. Amen. Well, it is uh, good to be back with you. It's been a little while. My name's Joe Scavato, one of the pastors here at Chapel Street. Uh, since we last saw each other uh, in the Scavato family, we celebrated a birthday. My son Luca turned one a few weeks ago. We're very excited about that, also incredibly overwhelmed. And uh, we uh, had many of our friends and, and our family members, they're very kind and, and brought gifts for him to celebrate that day. And we realized um, that we are at the point of life where the greatest gift that you could give him is not actually a gift at all. It is the thing that the gift is packaged in. Uh, any box, any bag, any wrapping paper, he goes crazy for it. Anything that's not actually a toy, he loves. Uh, the other day, he played with an empty water bottle for like 20 minutes and had the time of his life. It was great. Um, and so to, to kind of show you a little bit of what it's like to live in our family and be a part of our house, I brought a little video to show you what I'm talking about. So go ahead and play that. The look of confusion, I love it. That kid is more excited about everything than I am about anything. He's the best. I love him. Isn't that such a human thing, though? Isn't that just, maybe you remember that for, for yourself, maybe for your kids, where, you know, you wanted that thing so much. You wanted that gift for, for Christmas or for your birthday, and, and your parents or whoever, they spent their hard-earned money on it, and then it went completely unused because it came in a big box, or even better, it became surrounded by bubble wrap. And what's better than bubble wrap? We do this, don't we? Where, where we struggle sometimes to recognize the gift that we have been given. Today, we're uh, continuing in this series that we've been calling The Way. We've been in this series for, for several weeks now, and we've been looking at what it was about these early disciples of Jesus, these people of the way, as they were called that made them distinct, different, that, that set them apart from the world in which they lived. And we've been doing that, this so that we as followers of Jesus today would consider what it means for us to be disciples as well. If you've been part of this series, you might remember as we've looked at things like the way of generosity, the way of service, the way of love. And today, we turn our attention to the thing that was for Jesus, perhaps the greatest gift that his father gave him, a gift that for many of us, we often struggle to recognize and use as we turn our attention to the way of prayer. You don't have to answer this out loud, but, but if I were to ask you to describe your prayer life, how would you answer if I were to ask you what feelings come to mind when you think about prayer, what would you say? Guilt about not praying enough? Confusion on how to do it? Doubt that anybody is actually listening? Why do we pray? What is the purpose of prayer? Our goal today is to ask these questions, not just of ourselves, but of Jesus himself. What did Jesus teach about prayer? What did he believe and what allowed him to see prayer not as a burden, but as a blessing, as a gift from his heavenly father? What place does prayer have in my life? To answer these questions, we're gonna turn our attention to Luke chapter 11. If you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to turn with me there. Uh, we're going to look at these first couple of verses in this chapter, and we see Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. 
Many of you will have heard or even memorized the version we see in Matthew's gospel. Luke's version is a little bit shorter, but we're going to turn there and explore what prayer is truly about. So let's go to Luke chapter 11, starting in verse one. It says this. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Here we see these famous words, familiar, I'm sure, to many of us. But what I want to do today is look at this famous prayer, not just as a formula that we should memorize, but rather a model to teach us what Jesus truly believed the purpose of prayer was all about. So I want to point out just a few things to you today. First, we see a prayer of connection. A prayer of connection. I've mentioned this before. Uh, Judy and I, we started dating in college. um, And uh, it was my junior year of college. And that following summer, I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. I was doing short-term missions work. And the place where I lived and the area surrounding it had absolutely zero cell phone service and zero internet coverage. It also had zero air conditioning, which is not relevant to the story, but I just like to complain about it. (laughs) Now, I'm not sure... How it happened, this wasn't that long ago, uh, and, but we, that whole summer, we couldn't text, couldn't call, couldn't FaceTime. Like, I thought about writing her letters. I was getting desperate. Um, and so for two and a half months, our entire relationship was talking on the phone once a week, hearing about half of what we said. And I just remember the feeling of going back to school that following fall and actually seeing her every day and talking to her and having this thought come to me of this is how it's actually supposed to be. This is how relationships are supposed to work, actually seeing and talking to the person who knew. But I think for many of us, this is a picture of what our prayer life can sometimes be. Look with me again to this first verse of Luke chapter 11. It says, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Let's pause there. Let's ask a few questions before we get into this famous prayer. We're told this, that Jesus was praying. And we know that this is not a unique one-time thing. In fact, in Luke's gospel, there are nine separate occasions that he mentions Jesus praying, many of them during or before some of the biggest moments of his life. We see this during his baptism, he prayed before selecting his 12 disciples. He spent all night in prayer. We see it in the garden before his betrayal and his arrest and his crucifixion. We see this in Luke chapter five as well, this really interesting couple of verses. It says, even more the report about him, that's Jesus, went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. This is something that when you read scripture on your your own and when you see something repeated over and over again, you're supposed to take note of. You're supposed to notice. In other words, Luke is trying to point out to us that for Jesus, prayer was something that deeply shaped and marked his life. It was not something he did once a week. It was part of his everyday rhythm of life. Why? Why did Jesus pray so much? Have you ever thought about that? If he was and is the Messiah, if he is the son of God, then what could he possibly pray for that he couldn't just provide himself? For Jesus, for us, what is the purpose of prayer? David Platt, who is a pastor and author, put it this way. He said that the primary purpose of prayer is not to get something, but to be with someone. You see that? That prayer is so much more than what so many of us see it as. It is so much more than just memorizing some religious or spiritual sounding words. So much more than something we do just to not feel guilty. 
so much more than a way to get what we want in life. Prayer is the gift of time with the one who has created us. Prayer is the reminder that the God of the universe wants to have a conversation with me. I love how Pastor Brian puts this. He might've heard him say this before. He says that prayer is being loved by God. See, this is why Jesus would pray so much. In the same way that my relationship with my wife only grows when I spend time with her and see her and talk to her. My relationship with God, the closeness that I have with him, my ability to hear his voice and feel his presence comes only from time that I spend in prayer. Uh, Back when I was in high school, I was on my school's basketball team and, and all we ever wanted to do when we were practicing was scrimmage. And they had us do all these drills all the time. We would always practice these fundamentals and we thought we had outgrown them, that we had moved on to something more advanced. And so I remember one time we were complaining to our our coach about this and, and he, in response, pulled up a bunch of videos of some of our favorite NBA players, the biggest stars of the game, the masters of their craft, before games, practicing, doing drills, working on the same things that we did that we thought we had outgrown. See, this is how I think about prayer, that if Jesus, the son of God, the one who had a perfect relationship with the father, if he relied on and prioritized such a fundamental part of the Christian life, then how much more should we? Prayer is something that we have been designed to need, to spend time with the father. Back to verse one. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now imagine for just a moment that you were one of those disciples and imagine all of the things that you had seen to this point. Imagine all the miracles. Imagine all of the food you've seen multiply, the water you've seen walked on, the people you've seen healed. Imagine all the teaching that you've heard, the greatest preacher the world has ever seen. They have seen so much. And yet what's interesting about this is that this is the only thing recorded in all four gospels that the disciples ask Jesus to teach them. Not to preach, not to perform. Lord, teach us to pray. I wonder why that is. Surely they would have wanted to learn those things. So why this one request? We don't know, of course, but here's what I think that they realize, something that we must realize as well, that it is better to have the presence of God than it is to have the power of God. Prayer is not a weapon that we wield to get our way. Prayer is not about God's power joining our team. It is about us joining his about being present with the one who loves us. Lord, teach us to pray. Maybe for you today, this is where you need to start when it comes to prayer. Maybe you've tried praying before and it it just doesn't feel like anything happens. Maybe you used to pray, but you're just so busy and it's the first thing that gets cut from my daily routine. Maybe you go to pray and, and you just don't even know what to say and nothing feels right. What if you started here? Jesus, teach me to pray. Teach me that it's okay to not have all the right words. Teach me that it's okay to pray angry prayers, confused prayers, doubt-filled prayers. God, teach me to hear your voice. Remind me that prayer is not about getting something, but being with someone. This is what it looks like to pray a prayer of connection. That brings us to this model of prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples. Let's look at a prayer of surrender, a prayer of surrender. Um, It's always around this time of year that I think back to some of my favorite times I spent with my dad, uh, which were watching Bears games together. Uh, This is my son's first full football season. Uh, I kind of feel bad about raising him as a Bears fan. Anybody know that feeling? Um, Like, how much pain am I subjecting this kid to? Um, 
It kind of feels cruel. I even convinced Judy, by the way, uh, to make his birthday party bears themed. It was a berry happy birthday, which is pretty good, right? I am available to help plan your child's birthday party. But becoming a parent, I, I've just been reminded of those times that I spent with my dad. And just the, 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 the unspoken connection that I felt with him. The bonding experience that it was where we just enjoyed each other's presence, even as we watched one loss after another. But this, I think, is this image of prayer that Jesus gives us. Look again to Luke chapter 11 and verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. So this, according to Jesus, is how we are to pray and who we are to pray to. That God is both our heavenly father and that his name is hallowed, which just means holy or set apart. Now, we're used to this idea of God being our father, but for these disciples, this would have been kind of shocking to hear. Throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to as father only a handful of times, almost always in reference to the nation of Israel, not to me as a person. The Jewish people considered themselves too unworthy to even use his name. Many of them would just call him the name. But Jesus says, no, this is my father. He uses the term over 160 times. And here he teaches us something about prayer. That this is how we are to approach the God of the universe. The creator of all things. The one whose very name is holy and set apart. Father. Maybe today you need to hear the message that we can find in this one simple word. Maybe today you too have thought of yourself as too unworthy, as too sinful, as I have done too much for God to want to hear from me, so why even bother? Here with one word, Jesus reminds us that yes, God is holy, and yes, his name is set apart, and no, we shouldn't take that name lightly or in vain but that this is the good news of the gospel, that the almighty creator of the universe has made himself available to you, that he longs to have a relationship with you. You don't need to be afraid to approach the throne of God. Prayer is the gift of coming to the Father whenever you want and just as you are. In his book, uh, Knowing God, J.I. Packer writes about this idea He says this, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. In other words, at its core, Christianity is not about a set of rules that you have to follow. It is about a relationship with a loving and caring heavenly father. More than anything else, Your identity is child of God. Paul talks about this in uh, Galatians chapter four. This will be familiar to some of you. It says this, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. See, this is the gift of prayer, time spent in relationship, this unspoken connection with your heavenly father. There's a quote by uh, A.W. Tozer that says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And this, according to Jesus, is what we should think about God. Of a God who is hallowed, holy, set apart in all his ways, and yet who is loving and caring and good, a father who longs to hear from his children. Verse two, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Now, have you noticed something about who this prayer seems to be focused on? Look at it again. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. So here's the next thing that we can learn about prayer. That prayer reminds me that God is God and I am not. I've been so convicted this week thinking about this and preparing for this, about how many of my prayers are almost entirely me-focused. How often do I pray and it's something like, God, give me this, God, help me with this, God, take this away from me, okay, goodbye. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with bringing our requests to God. He loves hearing what's on our hearts. We're told in 1 Peter to cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. But can I ask you something? If I were that way in any other relationship in my life, if I went to my wife and the only time I talked to her was to get something from her, what kind of relationship would that be? See, prayer reminds us that God is God and I am not. It gives me the opportunity to get off the throne of my life. If you were here several weeks ago, you might remember we talked about the way of self-denial. We see this in Luke chapter nine, where Jesus tells his disciples that in order to follow him, they must deny themselves and pick up their cross. We talked about what that means, which is not to deny yourself things, not to deny who you are, but rather to deny yourself is for this prayer to come alive, that God's kingdom would come into my life, that he would be the one that sits on the throne, that I am the one that surrenders, that surrenders to his will and his way, and it is his kingdom that I am looking to advance. What a dangerous prayer this is. To say, God, in every part of my life, your kingdom come. God, over the future that I so desperately want to hold on to, over the past that I can't seem to let go of, your kingdom come. God, in the way that I spend my time and my money, God, in the way that I hold on to my anger and the insecurity and fear that I experience, your kingdom. God, your reign is welcome here. What about you? Is there a part of your life where you need to declare that God is God and I am not? This, of course, is not just something that happens in here, but something that happens out there as well. To pray your kingdom come ultimately is a desire for Christ to return, to establish his eternal kingdom. But here, Jesus is teaching us something about who we should pray for, not just ourselves, but for our neighbors, for our communities, for those all around the world. Do we do that? Do you pray for your neighbors, for your friends, for your coworkers? Do you pray for their good? Do you pray for their salvation? Do they know that you do? See, this is what it means to pray your kingdom come. It is a declaration of hope that in a world that is filled with brokenness, that we will not give in to apathy or judgment or divisiveness. It's the recognition that one of the greatest contributions to society that the church can offer is to pray that in every part of the world, Christ's kingdom would come, that love would grow, that justice would prevail, that peace and hope and goodness would spread. And we know that can only truly happen when Christ is made king. See, we do not just pray for God's kingdom for ourselves or for our family or for our own little circle. We pray for his kingdom to be made known everywhere. And then this is the difficult part. To pray your kingdom come is to give God permission to use me to be part of that kingdom bringing. Not in the ultimate sense, that's God's job but that this is to be my posture, that every day I am looking for opportunities to make things on earth as they are in heaven. That I would serve my neighbor in need, that I would pursue justice, that I would care for others, that I would be generous, that I would bring hope to those that are hopeless. This is bringing the kingdom. This is how we are to not just pray, but how we have been called to live. This is what it means to pray a prayer of surrender. That brings us to the last thing I wanna talk about today, a prayer of reliance. Turn with me to the last couple of verses of our passage in Luke. Luke 11, verse three. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. So here's the last thing that Jesus wants us to learn about prayer. That prayer reminds us of our reliance on God. This is what we see here. Three requests that he teaches us to make. To provide for us, to forgive us, 
and to lead us. We see this in verse three, give us each day our daily bread. Immediately the disciples hearing that would have thought of their history, of the time of Moses when God provided manna from heaven. He told them to each day take one day's provision to remind them of their reliance on God. I think it's difficult for us today to understand what this prayer really means. It's difficult for us when we live in a part of the world that works so hard to ensure our own provision. Last year, Judy and I, we bought a house and when we bought our our house, we became two fridge people. We have a fridge in our kitchen and in case that's not enough, we also have one in our garage. How crazy is that? How weird is this part of the world that we live in? We have so much that we take for granted. But this is what prayer accomplishes. It reminds us that everything I have could be gone tomorrow. That every day I have reliance on him. There's a proverb that talks about this. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30. I wanna just read a couple of verses. It says, two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Do you see that? In other words, God, give me just as much as I need. God, give me just as much as I need and not too much that I would forget to rely on you. What if we had the faith for that to be our prayer? God, give me just enough and nothing more. God, in the excess that I have, don't let me forget about my need for you. Prayer reminds us of our reliance on God's forgiveness as well. This is verse four. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Jesus, talking about this, takes it even further in uh, Matthew chapter six. Matthew 6 and verse 14, he says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. There is no room for resentment or bitterness or grudge holding or keeping score in the kingdom of God. Why? Because your heavenly father did not keep score with you. We forgive because we have been forgiven. This is the point of the gospel. And this is what prayer reminds us to do, to ask for God's forgiveness and to ask him for strength to forgive those who have wronged us. Not because they ask for it, not because they deserve it, but because this is the gospel. Last Prayer reminds us of our need for God's leadership. Go back to verse four. Lead us not into temptation. That word for temptation also meaning trial or test. See, this is what Judy and I do every day with our son as he crawls around our house trying to find the most dangerous thing possible to him. Anything that could get him stuck, trampled, tangled, trapped, he loves it. His favorite activity is grabbing the tail of our dog who's like 10 times bigger than him. He loves all that stuff. And so every day we are picking him up and putting him back into safety and leading him away from danger and putting him back on the right path. And this is what we are to pray for ourselves. God, lead me not into danger. Keep me from the things that you know I do not need. Keep me on the right path. Only you can do that. This is a picture of what prayer was always supposed to be an opportunity to spend time with your heavenly father, a reminder that he is God and we are not, a reminder that we have need to rely on him. And this is the last thing I want you to notice, that we were not created to pray alone. Did you notice that in this entire prayer, there is no I, there is no me, and there is no mine? What does it say? Lead us, forgive us, give us our daily bread. See, prayer was always something that we were meant to do together. So what I want to do today as we close, I wanna invite our worship team back up as they make their way up here. Go ahead and put the prayer back up on the screen. 
So we're gonna do something uh, together just to give us an opportunity to do what we have been called to do, to pray out loud together. How we're gonna do this is we're gonna pray it um, out loud one sentence at a time, and then we're going to just take a few seconds and pause and reflect on what it means because we know that prayer is not simply reciting words, but it is having a moment, having a conversation with our heavenly Father. So if you're able to, would you stand with me? And again, we're just gonna pray this one sentence at a time. We're gonna give a few moments just to reflect, just to pause. And then we'll worship together as a church family. So let's read this first sentence together. Father, hallowed be your name. All together. Father, hallowed be your name. And the next sentence, your kingdom come. All right, here's the long sentence. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And all together. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. Praise God. As always, if we can be praying for you, if there's something going on in your life, a way that we can come alongside you, we'd love to do that. Please let us know. We're here as a church family to go through life together. Now, would you receive today's benediction? Would you go now in the name and the power and the holiness of the Father? Go in the love of the Son and go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.